Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel, The Medieval Reader. So today is week three of my reading of Marco Polo's travels. And so today I will be talking about chapters five and six. Chapter five is called From Peking to Amoy, and chapter six is called From China to India. For the most part, I will be talking about China. Um, in the travels, the north is referred to as Cathay, and the south is referred to as Manzi which was a derogatory term used by the Mongols when they conquered China. Um, it basically means barbarians. Well, let's start with the normal, sane stuff, um, and then we can go on to talk about um, some of the details in the travels that probably aren't real. <laughs> and, and you will see what I mean in a moment. But he begins in the way that the other chapters have begun, where he talks about all of the different lands, describing the people as idolaters, who use paper currency, less civilized than the Mongols. Um, so again, the imperialists, in this case the Mongols, are presented as a civilizing force who are coming into these islands and um, just improving the lives of all the people, um, being more concerned about equality um, in one of the parts of China, one of the kingdoms. Women, before they are married, are tested for their virginity, um, a practice that Kublai Pakan gets rid of once he's conquered the ter territory because he knows that any kind of exercise um, can make it seem as if the woman is no longer a virgin. Um, there's some pretty interesting descriptions of um, practices by different groups of people to control their women. And while Marco Polo is critical of those practices, he still thinks it's great that these women are um, controlled, that they're contained. Marco Polo does actually rule a region under the Khan, so he rules a land called Yang Cha, which is the term that um, the author of the travels uses for the region that Marco Polo governed. In addition, Marco Polo creates some trebuchets to help um, defeat some of the Khan's enemies. But what I found particularly strange was that Marco Polo isn't always referred to in the third person. Sometimes it says, I, Marco Polo, did whatever. And then a few paragraphs later, it will say, Messer Marco Polo did whatever. So what's going on here? Um, now, there are a number of different manuscripts and every editor is going to choose which passages to keep and which passages not to keep. Um, so maybe that's part of the reason, but I thought that was really, really interesting that the same voice is not maintained throughout. The south of China, what the Mongols refer to as Mansi, is made up of nine provinces and it's a huge trading region um, because at the coast there's a city called Zaitan that receives a lot of goods from India. It's a huge port where goods are shipped and received. So the Khan's empire will produce a lot of spices for export, including salt, pepper, and sugar. Um, and then they will receive from India precious stones, other kinds of spices, pottery, just a number of other things. So it's just a huge trading port. The capital of Mansi is Kinsai. And Kinsai is known for being a pleasure city. So there are prostitutes, there are carriage and barge rides for wealthy people, for the merchants who are visiting, because Kinsai is near Zaitan. Hospitality is really, really important in the region, and there are even sewers to keep the streets dry. Unfortunately, according to the author of the travels, the indigenous king of the region was made weak by too much pleasure. So he was, as the author says, emasculated by the pleasure, making him vulnerable to attack from the Mongols. But enough of the normal stuff. Let's talk about some of the strange passages in these chapters. And we will begin, once again, with a description of an animal. So I will read you the description first and tell you 
what I think this animal is. So this is in this land called Basman, which is in Lesser Java, so what is today Indonesia. They have wild elephants and plenty of unicorns, which are scarcely smaller than elephants. They have the hair of a buffalo and feet like an elephant's. They have a single large black horn in the middle of the forehead. They do not attack with their horn, but only with their tongue and their knees, for their tongues are furnished with long, sharp spines so that when they want to do any harm to anyone, they first crush him by kneeling upon him and then lacerate him with their tongues. They have a head like a wild boar's and always carry its stoop towards the ground. They spend their time by preference wallowing in mud and slime. They are very ugly brutes to look at. They are not at all such as we describe them when we relate that they let themselves be captured by virgins but clean, contrary to our notions. So yes, Marco Polo claims that he saw unicorns. Now, my initial thought was, oh, this is a rhinoceros, right? A rhinoceros, you can see be, it being compared to an elephant. Um, it has maybe hair like a boar's. Um, it certainly has one horn, but it doesn't crush its enemies with its knees. And it certainly doesn't have a sharp tongue with which it kills its prey. Rhinos are herbivores. <laughs> so while most scholars believe that Marco Polo is talking about the Sumatran rhino, I'm not so sure. But Marco Polo doesn't stop there. He also has some pretty bizarre descriptions of human beings. And I think we can all agree that these humans have never existed. Now here is something really remarkable. I give you my word that in this kingdom, there are men who have tails fully a palm in length. They are not at all hairy. This is true of most of the men, that is, of those who live outside in the mountains, none of those in the city. Their tails are as thick as a dog's. There are also many unicorns and a profusion of wild game, both beast and bird. Later, he describes a number of indigenous communities as cannibals. And not simply cannibals who eat the dead or revenge kill their enemies and then eat them, which he has kind of mentioned earlier. No, here, they just, that's their whole occupation. He, in one of the lands, the people, as their daily occupation, cook and eat people. They eat foreigners, they eat their friends, they eat their enemies. I'm just like, what is this? No wonder people in Europe were horrified and terrified of all of these people. I mean, you have Marco Polo who claims that he's visited all of these lands. Like, what? People with tails? I mean, yes, it's true that some people have a genetic mutation where they do have a tail, but I mean, not like this. I mean, it's just crazy. Um, and it's important to note that Christopher Columbus read Marco Polo's travels and that definitely inspired him to go in search of India. Um, which brings me to another point. The Indies are referenced here a lot, but here we're not talking about the West Indies, we're, we're talking about India. So yeah, Marco Polo's travels responsible for a lot of outlandish views about non-Western, non-white people. Despite all of the really crazy things, I feel like I know what is true and what is false. And not just, you know, because there are animals being described here or humans that are being described here that obviously don't exist, but because Marco Polo spends the most time in the places that he actually visited and he really describes them in detail so that you know that he's actually been there, he's actually tasted these foods. There are a lot of lands that he just very cursorily mentions. I say he, but again, it's an anonymous author who's writing for Marco Polo, or I guess not, because sometimes Marco Polo speaks for himself. But anyway, that author will mention cursorily a land that Marco Polo claims to have passed through, but uses the same kind of wording, the same phrasing as for other lands that Marco Polo also claims that he visited, 
but you start to be suspicious that maybe he actually didn't visit those places if he's using the same adjectives to describe the people there and the same adjectives to describe um, the economy in those regions. So the parts that seem the most authentic to me are the ones that are the most described. Um, then I feel, okay, yeah, I think he's been there. So anyway, those are the chapters for today. There were some pretty interesting things going on and I will be finishing the travels next week. Um, and then after that, I will be doing a video on something that I don't want to share. Well, let's just say that if you like Harry Potter, you might like my video. And then afterward, um, I will pick up probably a, uh, some kind of a study, maybe a secondary source material um, from my shelves back here and do another multi-video series. Thank you everybody for watching and I will talk to you later. Bye now.